Hello and welcome to another installment of Behind the Dope for Dopey. My name is Dave, obviously the host of the Dopey podcast as well as the host of Behind the Dope. I am joined today by podcaster extraordinaire, the one and only coming to you live and direct from Oakland, California, often in the hinterlands of uh, Marin and where are you else you at? Fucking Ganja, Ganja Central. Begets from the Upful Life. Welcome. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. It's an honor to be here. I think you meant to say Grass Valley, which is That's where all I meant the weed farms are. Yeah. Yes. Grass Valley. I was just thinking the other day about your episode in the Ganja Farms and uh, that you told it on one of the early, you know, in the 30s, like around Dopey 30 something about uh, you driving to L.A. up here to, to work at one of those farms. And I just think, what it would have felt like if you if a guy like you rolled in with a knapsack full of methadone bottles, uh, I just it's no surprise that it went left. We were talking about shame today, and I had that was an an incident that I had a lot of shame, uh, and and Howie is dopey YouTube producer, and uh, and fellow Jew who's never smoked a joint. Howard is with us. Howie, you want to pop in? Say hi to B. Hello. What's up, Howie. Howie? What's up? Good um, to put a face with a voice. There he is. Now he's gone. That's what she said. So, Howie, just stay on because I'm going to tell the story really fast, and I want to hear your reaction. Stories. When I when I was addicted to heroin and methadone, I got it. And I was living in Los Angeles. My girlfriend got me a job trimming weed in a ganja farm Perfect in in Sedona, California, and I and I got thirty bottles of methadone because I was supposed to be there for the month. And I like drove up there and I was like falling asleep behind the wheel. I like pulled over and took a nap on the way up. And I got, I got lost. I got pulled over by the cops. I had, I had Xanax on me. I had weed on me. I had 30 bottles of methadone. They still let me go. I got to the ganja farm. I think I stayed there for 24 hours and I was so annoying. They asked me to leave. (laughs) What a surprise. I know right. it's like very nice. shameful. Okay, Howie, you can go. That was nice. I appreciate that. Uh, and B is a is a not only is he a podcaster, he's a writer, uh-huh. and he's also a ganja farmer. What? Yeah. Well, I work on the farms. I, I'm, I've never had my own project, but uh, yeah, I've been up there a lot. Not so much this year, actually. The the music journalism is, I'm grateful, has picked up a bit. So uh, not as much trimming or bucking or watering or all the menial chores that come with tending to a ganja garden but it's very meditative and we don't have the affliction like you or your listeners it's you know it's a joyful job but i could never imagine being in recovery and showing up to work in a ganja garden right and then let me ask you this i know that when he sent me home after a day of work i think he gave me like a half ounce for my trouble and sent me on my way um when you work in the ganja world, I'm sure they're like showering you with nuggets. Do you have do, do you do you ever have to buy bud, or are you always getting free bud? Um, occasionally I do visit the dispensary, whether it's because I I'm out of it, or you want a CBD strain or something that's less this or a sativa, any a number of reasons why you would go to the dispensary. But it's called little, so the little tiny pieces of weed that fall through the screen when you're trimming they either you know go with the shake or sometimes the laborers are able to take some handfuls so yeah i'm I'm lucky that we have kind farmers that are saying sure have some littles so that's always a nice perk at the end of a couple weeks or months working is a, a several fistfuls of this strain or that strain that you know sustain me for half the year I think just the phrase "littles" is worth the the the, the cost of admissions for me. That's such a great hippie <laughs> hippie term. You could take it, littles. Exactly. Um, what was I going to say? Now, now, I mean, yes, dopey is for. I mean, a lot of people are in recovery smoking bud. B is in 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 recovery smoking bud. So I don't think the two right. are mutually exclusive. And just just let me be a tourist, uh, a, a voyeur for a second. What kind of strains are you currently? puffing down on um mac one 
is, okay. a, is a popular one right now. Various different like Skittles offshoots. Skittles. Um, yeah. Purple Skittles. Yeah. They're like uh, ice cream Skittles, which is like an ice cream cake Skittles cross. I, I, there's a lot of different cakes, you know, like ice cream cake, wedding cake, and they're different, you know, sort of uh, the the genetics are really you know like cultivated over years and generations and different sun patterns and different parts of california and full sun or light deprivation in a in a greenhouse or indoor and there's all these variables that make different strains come out differently depending on the garden depending on the geography depending on the nature of the feeding cycle and the nutrients or here's another one you'll like like littles it's called newt newt is how you feed your plant what kind of right. nuts do you use? And so all that stuff figures in. Um, I just work for somebody that's a good friend and he's good to me. And I kind of don't really see the full spectrum of when I first got out here, I was bouncing around to this farm, to that farm, whoever needed help. But the key is to find somebody that you know and love and trust. And that's reciprocal. And that's who I work for whenever I can. But uh, let me ask like you I mentioned, this. I'm, I'm out of the loop a little bit this year. I got to be real, Dave. I'm not coming to you live and direct from the ganja farms like the past decade or so. I've been busy, and I'm about to get married. We're planning a wedding. There's a lot oh, of stuff tub. that comes That's between nice. me and the and the ganja farm at this point. How much How much will nuggets be present in, at the nuptials? Like, oh, will there yeah, be a wedding be, cake? Oh. Wedding cake? <laughs> I can't wait to tell her about that. That's classic. Uh, I mean, there'll be open chiefing. You know, like uh, it's no secret in our family Wait, hold on hold, 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 hold up hold up open chiefing yeah like like blatant weed smoking not like huddling off somewhere so you don't get i never Those heard of open chiefing hold on what is open chiefing like is it what does the chiefing mean exactly chiefing is is blazing weed like uh with with zero fuck like you chief and you're like openly blazing i used I'm to chief chiefing. i used to chief hardcore back in the day yeah god damn I, it I know. um what was I going to say? Old. What I what I think is very interesting to me, and I want to ask this question. You know, when when Bud became more, you know, recreational, legal, and more of the country, and, and more cities started to fall. Like when you talk about these strains and and the sun patterns and the newts and all this stuff, like it really becomes kind of like almost winery talk, you know, how they talk about the grape and caring for it. Do you think that's really, I mean, I know back in the day when I, I would read high times and I would try to learn as much as I could learn in, in between getting wasted and stuff. Do you think that with, with full on recreational use, it becomes way more like wine? Yeah. Well, there's different, it, it's, for better or for worse, it mimics the wine industry quite a bit. First of all, we're in Northern California, so many people who are in the wine business got into the cannabis business. There's also right. like craft cannabis, which mm. is the small garden that's very meticulously tended to, and, and there's a lot of attention to detail for each individual plant. And then there's commercially grown cannabis, which are huge greenhouses or facilities full of hundreds, if not thousands of plants that don't get the attention to detail. So then when you think of like the box of wine versus, you know, the really niche, you know, Chardonnay or whatever, it's the same principle. Like one thing got a ton of attention and that labor and energy costs considerably more. Well, I love to hear about this stuff. Now, I want to have one more question before we get into our Jerry Garcia behind the dope. And my <laughs> question is, I used to love Purple Bud like deeply purple bud, bud that was so purple that if it was the proper purple, somehow it even tasted purple. Now, how is the, what's up with the purple bud out there? You smoking purple bud or no? Yeah, there's plenty of purple bud. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, like back when I lived in Vermont in the 90s when I was in college, there was the Vermont Perps, mm. which was an outdoor strain, The way, or not even a strain, it's just a style of, cannabis that came out of vermont again it was sun facing relative to the sun um now they've like you know identified different genetics and stuff that they can then like you know bring out the purple that's what i'm talking about but and yeah it looks like it's ridiculous when you hold it in your hand i don't want to 
I don't want to talk too like mouth watering okay. about this. One more question. Know, <laughs> One more question <laughs> before at. we go on to the Jerry Garcia behind the door. It's all about triggering. Um, when I was young, we would often go to the meadow in Central Park, and there was some kid there that sold what he called the chocolate tie. And I was a kid, right? I was I was nineteen, twenty, whatever, and it was it, it didn't look good. But maybe I was kidding myself, right? That when I smoked the chocolate tie, I would taste nodes of chocolate. Is there any bud now in this highly scientific world that has any chocolatiness to it? I'm sure. I'm sure. I can't think of one off the top of my head. There's not one that's in like my you know sphere of of society, if you will. I, I can't remember like buying anything or seeing it at a dispensary, but sure. Of course. It's funny. The other day, <clears throat> this is how it is out here now. You talk about going to the park. When I go to the park here in Oakland, they have open vendors with huge mason jars full of strains. Like I'm talking like ounces and ounces and ounces spread out next to families playing, picnicking people, food truck there. It's not legal, but it's like black market, but it's, it's unabashed, like zero fuck given. You can walk down to the park and spend a lot less money for a lot more ganja, but you don't necessarily know what you're getting. It's kind of old school, like the way you're talking about back then, but now it's blatant. Nobody's hiding right. anything. There, there's like signs made by children, you know? <laughs> right, and Bud's probably being sold by children too. I, I, no, no, you these, know, these were not kids selling. For sure. I don't want to misrepresent. I'm just saying it was a very carnival family atmosphere with several weed vendors. No, we were in we were in Bennington over the summer, and they sell like a like a farmers market, and it's like there you have apple right. pies and peach pies and some flower decorations and then nuggets of the dank, like and like just there. How, how did you handle everything. that? How did you handle like, that? I was just like, <laughs> oh, the dank. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or like, but it's worse than that because I'm with Nor. I'm with my kids. And, and yeah. Nora's like, oh, look at that painting. Look at that T-shirt. Look at that artisanal soap. Look, the dank. And it's just like you got to <laughs> you got to like move through it. But I, what's harder is in Manhattan. You know what I mean? Like I'm walking down Fifth Avenue and they have these Weed World RVs where they Those just sell crazy. they just sell what nuggets. Heard you want to yeah. chime in? You got if you chime in, you got to chime in. I asked you a question. Right. Weed World, I don't know if, if Mr. B. Gatz knows about this, but it's some disgusting corporate thing. They have these massive RVs that are fucking done up with, you know, macro imagery of nuggets and then lollipops. And then for years, they only sold CBD lollipops yeah. that they said That's what was like from this strain or that strain. But after recreational bud passed, now they sell nuggets. They sell joints in Washington Square Park on tables, probably very similar to what you just described. Right, they crazy. don't sell nuggets in jars in Washington Square Park, just big fat joints for 10 bucks each. And on Houston Street, like where there used to be coffee carts, there's nugget carts. But my friends who I work with at Katz's are like, it's the driest fucking bullshit garbage uh, around. And they don't <laughs> want to buy nuggets there. So it's interesting. That is interesting. You know did what? You Maybe know they shouldn't be. Guest... Huh? I was going to say, did you know that Garcia owned property in Mendocino weed farms? I didn't. Yeah, yeah. It's a fact. It's in a bunch of his biographies. Yeah, he had a property in Mendocino County, and he, he was never there, but they operated. And this is in the 70s and 80s. Operated ganja grows, heady nuggets. I, he would definitely like. I mean, Snoop has a strain named after him, right? Wouldn't Jerry at this point? Oh, his family has Garcia hand pick. It's a. It's like somewhere. It's like heavily funded. So I don't want to call it craft cannabis in the in the sense of what real craft cannabis is, but it it markets itself as a craft cannabis. It's just widely available in California, and his daughters and his uh, ex wife, uh, Mountain Girl, are behind Garcia hand pick. I wrote a little article about that for like a cannabis blog when the when the whole thing was rolled out. Did they send you nuggets for that? They did not. That's no. bullshit. I just did it out of the love, you know. We should write them a letter and see if we can get you some nuggets for that. I, I just want to talk to Mountain Girl or Trixie, a Garcia family member. That I got plenty of weed. I want the interview. I think we could do that. Let's work on that. Now, okay. 
Behind the Dope is a new segment where we tell dopey stories on YouTube. And last night, uh, B sent me this article about Jerry, and I thought it would be a perfect Behind the Dope, and I thought it would be a perfect kickoff collaboration between Dopey and the Upful Life on on where drugs, addiction, music, and uh, culture all cross. I love it. I love it. We ended up talking a bit of recovery on the show over the years. You kind of broke the ice. Actually, no, I take it back. This photographer Jeffrey did in like the fourth episode. But but there are, you know, Neil Francis is a sober musician. And most of his episode of my podcast was related to his journey through and out of alcoholism. So, yeah, there's Mike Dillon there. Mike Dillon was a big recovery episode. That was a crazy episode. You know, that best com- uh, compliment that I ever received was when his mom posted that she learned about her own son from my show. Awesome. And, and that was like, touched my heart in a main way. But, and I uh, think my up- episode, my episode of The Upful Life might have been the best interview I ever did. So I, I commend it, well, you. I've listened to an, a, a lot of yours. I think I probably stopped after about 12. But uh, I think mine that we did was, Fantastic. I got great feedback. At the time, people were saying it was the best ever. I mean, you've been on Marin since then. There have been some other ones, you know, but. You were right there, it's, though. Fuck it. Yeah. So, I'm so grateful why don't you came you... on. Still number one. Number one? Yeah. You're st- you and the guy from QAnon Anonymous podcast, neck and neck for most downloads ever on my show. That's awesome. I'm very excited for yeah. that. So, how, I want to make a, take a second here. How, Howie, pop in for a second. Yeah. You understand that B Gets has a podcast called The Upful Life. What am I a moron? I'm sh- sitting. Just sh- 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 He doesn't. He's, kind of, <laughs> he's a little bit slow. Now he, I was the number one guest. I understand. Ah, that. and that's Along with QAnon. Don just or... okay. Just stop it. All right. Now B, can you please um, walk us through this amazing article you sent me? Sure, sure. Obviously, I dressed for the occasion. If you can see, I'm wearing my Garcia shirt. Um, I see. So it's no secret Garcia uh, struggled with opiate addiction for, you know, two decades, give or take. Mid-70s, he died in August of 95. And, you know, there's been a lot written about, you know, the the acid tests and and sort of, we Dave, we've talked about the romanticizing of hippie lore. Um, And, of course, you go to the dead or dead and company these days are you see anything grateful dead it's colors it's circus it's day glow it's the pranksters it's the electric kool-aid acid test it's all this kind of you know uh avant-garde really ahead of the time psychedelic revolution but the underside of that coin it was the abyss of garcia's heroin addiction which obviously made him look like he was in his 70s or 80s in his 50s and really robbed uh, the dead of a lot of prime years because of his affliction. And um, this blog that I sent you, which is JGMF, stands for Jerry Garcia's Middle Finger. And uh, that group of, it's like one guy specifically um, that runs it, but there's a group of commenters in there, like dead scholars, you know? It's not a tabloid situation it's uh it comes from a place of integrity and journalism and and they don't want to sugarcoat it he's not captain trip you know he had some darkness I and mean, he was there's a lot of things you know besides being jerry garcia the grateful dead not necessarily the best father longtime addict um, among the women in his life anyway so there the reason i bring this up is there has been sort of a reluctance of people to really examine that because you know, he's gone and we want to celebrate him for all the gifts. And I think that this article is just a really brutally frank and ugly, dark view into where Garcia was uh, at this time, which was in January of 1985. The article specifically is basically an examination of his arrest at Golden Gate Park, where he was basically chasing the dragon and making crack in the in the driver's seat of his car park in San Francisco uh, under the premise of quote finishing his stash on the way to rehab this was five days after the band had staged a big ass intervention which uh you know they had done some sort of passive aggressive stuff or wrote him a letter this wasn't the first 
but this was like a major one where they showed up where they all showed up and it was ultimatums and anger and you know billy kreutzman was cursing at him and there's always been a, a laissez-faire attitude in the grateful dead like if you're not harming anybody like you're on your own trip show up for the gig you know like so they they allowed this problem to fester and exacerbate into something tremendously ugly and depraved before they even stepped up and said something. So this but is the other side. The other side of that coin is that, yeah, the dead robbed Garcia or Garcia robbed the dead of, of, you know, many years of, of going on, but the dead couldn't have done anything without Garcia. Without. Garcia was like the ridiculous engine and the, you know, the, the number one creative force of energy yeah. beyond behind the band. And, and you can often hear, like, I remember there's a famous quote of, of Bob Weir talking about how, like, if they go to a town, you know, Weir and, and, and Phil Lesh and Kreutzman and Mickey Hart can basically walk around, but Jerry couldn't walk around. If right. you saw Jerry, like, he was mobbed, and, like, the only place that he felt safe was high, alone, practicing guitar so he was in a prison right. of his own making so like when they staged the intervention he's like what the fuck i've been i've been like giving you guys millions of dollars on my back and that's when right. he loses his kind of laissez-faire hippie shit right yeah well he i don't think he ever lost the laissez-faire i just think the decorum of like uh good vibe maybe he he went by the wayside and i don't want to misspeak and say garcia robbed it was the addiction like yes his black abyss is what robbed like garcia gave 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 so much that's actually much. how we got there right and there was a deification you know like he was looked at as a god there were certain groups of deadheads that actually believed he was god reincarnated now granted this is after a lot of acid and a lot of long rides in the car and you know there's but there were like messianic type who cultivated like groups of followers that so he was in addition to being celebrated as the leader of deadheads he was also foisted upon this role of like deification of godliness which he wanted none of and the bigger it got the further he was pushed into the comfort the warmth the isolation and plus he you know he wasn't like uh get so fucked up embarrass himself he liked to be just high enough just high enough to play the gig just high enough you know like so but over the time he, that what really harmed him was his other habit such as three packs of unfiltered camels every day since he was 18 plus you know ice cream and just just bad hygiene bad nutrition plus you know anywhere from 800 to 1200 a day persian heroin habit um and that, that was his thing. He never was a needles guy. You know, he liked the certain brown Persian heroin. He was willing to pay a premium for it. And But if you look at the cover of that magazine on that article, he's got white powder all over his fucking shirt. His knuckles are black from the foils. And as you see the arsenal of drugs he had when he was arrested, it's terrifying to think that that was like an afternoon stash on the way to rehab now you Wait, what did he have it, i mean you can read it he had here uh, should i read the contents yeah one brown briefcase containing miscellaneous papers one uh police department property envelope 990 dollars inside three paper bindles containing brown powder found in a rose tin one baggie of six cotton swabs one plastic container liquid one glass container liquid Eight pieces of foil with burnt residue, 11 paper bindles with brown residue in a bag found in briefcase, one paper bindle of white powder found in briefcase, one Ziploc bag containing one yellow Lego paper bindle containing white powder labeled half gram, one paper bindle with brown rock-like substance, one cooking glass with prong holders, seven cigarette lighters, one razor, one uh, quarter-inch metal tool, or four-inch, I'm sorry, one four-inch metal tool, a zipper brown pouch, seven heart Seven of Hearts playing card, which is very Hunter-esque, the Seven of Hearts, and then uh, a rose metal box. All that to say, he was basically had everything he needed to cook bass and everything he needed to smoke Persian. And 
you got to wonder, I mean, this is how hardcore deadheads are. They're like wondering why he's at Golden Gate Park because he was headed to rehab here in Oakland and he lived in Marin. So the thinking is that he was actually, he like drove to the site of the being and the hate and like where the, it all began, you know, for the dead and was just sitting there taking stock of his life, getting high on the way to rehab. Like, cause it, it just, I mean, I live here. It's a very out of the way route to go from point A to point B. Um, is that why so, you think he went? I mean, I'm going on what the dead scholar, I mean, I can plug into that. Like if I'm about to like, basically after I've been fighting with everybody around me, trying to avoid taking responsibility for this addiction and I'm finally being called out on the carpet and I got to go to rehab and I could see, I mean, I can't put myself in anybody's mind, let alone his, but you could see, anybody could see the need to have like a contemplative, you know, I mean, it's a very, that? it's a very sentimental, right? Sentimental yeah. move. And I never Nostalgia. saw him as, as a sentimental. I mean, like, if, lyrically, you can see him as nostalgic or sentimental, but when you hear him talk about stuff, he never seemed sentimental like that. No, which is why it may not have been. I mean, there's been a million reasons why people thought he went there. Maybe he copped there. Maybe he had a different errand there, but he was so stuck in his ways and so antisocial and, and so far gone in his addiction that it was just hard to imagine why he would go there. And, and it happens to be this site of like where this hippie deadhead thing came to light right down to apparently it was like a mere days from the anniversary of the human being which was a revelatory event um not to say he was thinking about the anniversary only that he was where that happened he was a hop skip and a jump from the hey dashbury and i don't know like unfortunately it took he didn't even get right after this rehab and then he had a coma in 86, which was relative to diabetes, where he like lost the ability to play for a while. I mean, you know the story. And then he had a lot of touch and go with good time, back in it. Good time, back in it. And the dead really wanted to tour. He didn't want to. But then when they wouldn't, he'd go out with Jerry Band, which he had a drug buddy in that band, John Kahn, the bass player. So the dead resented jerry band because they looked at it as that's his get high money or his you know stay out of our sight kind of vibe his junky friends yeah but i mean and they're not wrong but i mean jerry's gonna do what jerry's gonna do i mean he was getting high on dead tour too and that's what i really think is the issue is like by the time it got to be late 80s early 90s the machine the, the fact that they could play 50 stadium shows you know selling out across the country and the staff of the dead company had over a hundred employees that had kids and it was all predicated on the touring machine. And meanwhile, Garcia was dealing with carpal tunnel and nerve issues, let alone he was getting divorced, getting remarried. The art stuff was taking on a life. He's just getting pulled in a million directions. And what did he really want to do more than anything? Like play bluegrass in David Grisman's living room. That's what well, he that's wanted to do. That's the coolest thing about the whole period. You have this sweaty, fucking train wreck, diabetic guy. I went to see him in like '93 or '94 at uh, Giant Stadium, and I remember he's like nodding out during Candyman, and I'm just like, I remember screaming, "This sucks!" Like I wasn't fully initiated, and I just couldn't believe that that's what I was experiencing. But then years later, when you listen to the Garcia Grisman stuff, which is just around the same time, he's lightning yeah. in a bottle. He's like as tidy and brilliant as he ever was, and sounds more alive than ever. Which goes to show, like he just wanted to be doing new shit and and be finding himself. And he didn't like being this this vestige, you know, like this vest, whatever you call it, like a vestibule. dinosaur. Ve not vestibule, vest, vestige? What am I? Uh, vestige. Vest vagina. Vestige. Vagina? Yep. Yes. Vestige of yeah. the path. Did you say yeah. vagina? I don't know what the hell you're trying to say. Um, I know also my favorite, whatever, I don't know why, but my favorite story is that, is that Jerry, Jerry Band story in Philly where he like, they lose the packages of dope. I remember I read I read that Rock Scully book 
high and I read it kicking. Me too. Like, like I would read that book kicking because it was so exciting to be on the, on the road. And that story where he, they would send the, the Persian ahead in packages. And you can imagine how much Persian they're sending ahead because how many packages they probably lost. And, and they get to Jersey and they lose it all. And he, I mean, like, do you think they were doing radio interviews often or did he just do the interview for that? I'm not sure what, like, how frequently there are, like, scattered interviews of that kind, like, of little college radio station interviews and stuff. But that one in particular, and again, I, I should state, uh, in the pantheon of dead scholars, like, the Rock Skelly book, while entertaining is kind of factually dubious. He just like messes up stuff that's e easily proven date wise. Can't be this or that. But that said, he does relate a lot of stuff that's unavailable everywhere else, particularly that dark time in the early eighties where they had a duplex and he was upstairs and Garcia yeah. was downstairs. So I just want to, you know, and that definitely happened. Like he went on radio and he kept dressing down, come on down to the show. We want to see you down here, like coding, Who's you know, gonna come us. down for Garcia tonight? Right, come down exactly. for Garcia. Over and, over. and I don't think he got yeah. dope. I don't think anyone brought him dope. I think this, and I could be confusing the story, but I think so. It was Valium, and he may have been like bumping into the mic. Uh, yeah, at that performance, or I yeah. could be getting the performances uh, mixed up. But yeah, by the end, dude, he was just in such poor health. Forget the dope. Like, you know, I don't even want to talk about some of the ailments physically because they're kind of like embarrassing and emasculating and like he just had a really hard time getting around and caring for himself at the end yet he's playing stadium you know and it you know and again the other side of that coin is the minute they stop touring he's booking jerry garcia band-aid in the same condition um and what's worse the monstrosity of the dead machine which just like just pounded him or the cocoon of the Garcia band thing where he can just stay nice and high and float from town to town with no stress. He liked option B a lot better. Um, who knows what was better for him? Probably neither. I think, but the Grisman's, best Grisman's the, living room was, was what was good. for him. And, and I loved in that late eighties period where he, he went to Hawaii and he's sober and or he's just smoking bud and he's, yeah. he's like scuba, scuba diving, diving. And like you could, I mean, like, and you can see interviews with Phil Lesh later on, and he was just like, "If only we had thought about Jerry, and like realizing that he needed health." You know what I mean? He he was dying right in front of them. You know, it's like, what a rough position to be in. Why don't you think Phil plays with them anymore? I mean, they did the fairly well thing in 2015, uh, the six shows to kind of close the book. Um, I think that was it for him. Uh, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, there's a book about post Garcia dead drama. Um, I have it on the bookshelf. I can't remember. The author's name is Joel Selvin. But there's a lot of money stuff. There's a lot of ego stuff. Phil's wife apparently um, is a whole lot for the rest of the guys. I mean, that's no secret. I'm not like talking out of turn there. Um, Phil had the Terrapin Crossroads venue here which was kind of like home base for a while. He's also 82 now and is on a replacement liver. Mm. Um, he's also, you know, like they, Phil and him did the further thing. They did the quote, the dead with Warren Haynes. So it's not like Phil has been absent since 95. I just think like he doesn't want to keep going to the well, you know, and I'm not here to shit on dead and company, but I understand why he doesn't want to do that. And I respect his choice, but Phil, you know, he's he's not just all rainbows and unicorns. He has kind of a reputation like that, but he's he's a businessman and he puts Phil first. And I, you know, I got a lot of love for Phil, but uh, I also feel like he's he's kind of taken a bit of a hard line uh, with some of that stuff. That's a bit of a head scratch. Right. No, I get it. I'm no dead in company guy personally. Um, it's too. I mean, like, it doesn't matter. I don't want. Me, I don't want to. I was. Yeah, I respect it. Oh, look, it's carrying on the traditions, right? It's how next generations are going to find out about it. And they are. I'm not, again, I, yeah, I don't have anything negative to say about it other than, like, I don't walk out of the shows with, like, my heart in my hands. I still do that when Phil plays, you know? Not every time, 
but I do. But with that company, nice. it's it's kind of like been like uh, homogenized in a way, and the John Mayer factor, which he's an amazing player, but there's a certain element that comes with that. It just doesn't feel quite like I'm at a dead show. But uh, more powerful. No, I I always think it's just because of the singing. That's just my hunch about it. Like people always underestimate the importance of Garcia's singing. To me, like I think that's yeah. the thing that people like. Yeah, John Mayer, like he plays his ass off, but he doesn't sing sweet. He sings like Stevie Ray Vaughan or something. I don't know. Um, I don't want to bash on that either. But like, what did we miss in this article that was killer dopey material? I mean, I sent it to you just to. So you could see what his routine was at, at the quote unquote rock bottom. There's even an argument in the comments, whether this is rock bottom. If you haven't hit the comments and you just read the article, I recommend it. Cause there's like a very respectful discussion about this scenario among some writers like Blair Jackson and David Gans and stuff like in the comments of this article, some of them are taking them to task. Like, dude, come on, have some respect. And other people are like, what the hell? We're trying to talk about history here. This isn't about tabloids. This is about like getting the story right. And I think that's something that, you know, anyone writing about this has or discussing it has to uh, balance, like having respect and a healthy bit of like reverence for the struggle. I mean, you, both of you and I have been down the abyss of opiate addiction relatively bad. But imagine not being able to go anywhere or do anything, having every move yeah. of yours. Like I can't even imagine. Nope. It. You know, I, we would all run for the numb, you know? So I, I don't really have any judgment here. I was more just kind of, after all these years, blown away to have such a detailed accounting of Garcia's briefcase. You know, because <laughs> we, were, we were tweeting about the briefcase the other day, and it's like, Wonder what's in the briefcase. Now we know. Exactly. I'm surprised there's no DMT, ether, fucking, you know, weird, disassociative. Like, I, but once you're a fucking smoking crack and, and smoking yeah. dope all day, you don't care about tripping in the same way, for sure. Which is yeah. sad. I think they were long past regular psychedelic use. But there's stories of them still dosing later into life. You know, even we're well past the death. Right. You know. Right. That's, I think that's, I mean, the other thing that you said that I think is important to mention also is that, yes, the whole thing was this day glow carnival of like psychedelia, whatever, but the underbelly besides the addiction was the dream of being on the road, like the beats and the beats whole thing was this dangerous adventure and Garcia, you know, he like, I remember, you know, the quote in, uh, in, uh, Long Strange Trip, where, where uh, Sam Cutler is like, Garcia described the Grateful Dead as the clearing in the forest with the daisies. Did you yeah, see that? Yeah. But sure. at the same time, so, so Garcia describes the dead as the clearing in the forest with the daisies, but just the same way, it's, it's Kerouac and Neil Cassidy on the road, Allen Ginsberg, debauchery, poetry, Burroughs, all that shit. So, like, that's all tied in. Um so it's like it's that's but that's why we love it. It's magic and mayhem and mystery and technicolor and black and white all rolled into one. Yeah, and I, I like yourself. I only got to see Garcia in the waning years. My first show was in '92, and my last was about a month. It was a it was a giant stadium in summer '95. Um, so when you listen back or read about that era of the dead, it's people are often really critical and, and Garcia was in bad shape and there was a lot of flubs and lacked inspiration. However, ballads, nineties ballads, whether it's a war frat, a Stella blue, a standing on the moon, the last so many roads or uh, Dylan's visions of Joanna. Um, Garcia really shined. He really like the depth of his despair and the place we're talking about where he was at emanate from those performances. So I still listen to 90s Jerry Ballads like every day because there's a certain soulfulness. Hope. Yeah, it's soulful and it's it's real and like he's so checked out for all the well not all, but a lot of the other stuff. He's just going through the motions playing the riff. But when it's time to to sing those songs, he somehow digs somewhere so deep. I'm still brought to tears by it like regularly like hearing him belt out a visions or a so many roads knowing that he's got weeks or months left in his life you know 
and now knowing that, like hearing where he's digging from for that, like, so I don't even shit on '90s Dead. I, I I'm objective, you know. I'm, I'm I'm understand that a lot of it was lethargic, and nowhere near the glory days, but there there's gems in there too, and and I'm grateful I got to see those nine shows. I got nine dead shows, one Jerry band. And I, my first dead show, I was 14, and my last, I was seven. So that there little, like, adolescent crest, I got in there, and here I am. I'm living in the Bay. I'm playing the dead. I'm be 44 in two days. So uh, it had a, a lifelong effect on me. Well, I appreciate this this journey, this deep dive into Jerry, weed culture, 90s dead briefcase full of drugs and all the rest happy birthday b thanks and yeah, uh I stay strong birthdays. dopey nation i, I love older. birthdays enjoy it enjoy your birthday get a birthday it. hat and fucking tools thanks for, for having Chris. me dude are you kidding me it's always a pleasure <laughs>